Hi, and welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you, first off, so much for sending in all of the lovely pictures via Twitter. I especially, while I appreciate all of the dog pictures, dog, um, other species combinations are always my favorite. So I really loved getting to see some dogs and cats hanging out and a dog and a ferret hanging out as well. So I'm going to go ahead and start my second part of the presentation. And in this part of the presentation, I'm going to talk a lot about um, our human perceptions of our dogs and how that might affect our behavior or the way that we treat dogs. And so just as a little review, for those of you who maybe weren't able to watch in the last couple of days, or even for those of you who, are, who were able to watch uh, over the last couple of days, um, I want to start by saying, you know, of course we can't judge a book by its cover, and we really can't judge a dog by its appearance, but we seem to be just driven to do so. So um, as Dr. Carlson mentioned yesterday, you know, we'll take a look at some of these mixed breed dogs, and we're going to say, oh, well, that one is an English Bulldog uh, lab mix. Or we might say, well, that one is certainly a Rottweiler um, poodle mix. Or, you know, this one obviously has some Chihuahua in it. But we can't really know that that's actually what's in those mixes of dogs. Um, there's so much recombination that happens um, when we're breeding mixes with other dogs that um, their appearance can look quite variable. And um, as has been mentioned in previous uh, talks this weekend, less than 1% of the domestic dog's genome is responsible for this amazingly wide range of physical variation that we do see between dogs. And it, that is really remarkable. I mean, to think that we could have, you know, a large Great Dane and an itty bitty Chihuahua and that they're actually the same species is really kind of mind boggling. But in the end, you know, it's a really small percentage of their genome that's actually driving that physical variation. And they're really both dogs. I mean, that's what they are, regardless of what they look like. They're the same species and they have um, very, it's the same set of behaviors. And um, we really can't judge much or make assumptions based on their actual physical appearance. Now, what's really interesting is that while we've selected dogs for certain working traits over a few thousand years, uh, a lot of the artificial selection that has taken place that has created this wide range of physical variation in dogs has really happened in the last uh, 100 to 200 years. So it started in the Victorian era when people were interested in making specific types of dogs. And that means that these dogs were selected a lot for their physical traits rather than their behavioral traits or working ability. And some of the research is now showing that we actually have a lot more behavioral variability between, or I'm sorry, within a breed than actually between different breeds of dogs. That means that while these three uh, dachshunds look very similar in terms of conformation, so their body shape and size, um, they could actually behave quite differently from one another. So they are all individuals even though they look very similar to one another. We also know, based on some of the research that was done by uh, my colleague, Dr. Voith, as well as Dr. Irizarry, that we have a really hard time predicting a mixed breed dog's genetics based on appearance. And this isn't just the average general population. Um, as they mentioned, this has been uh, uh, studies done where they looked at people who had experience with dogs, who worked with dogs all the time, who saw a wide range of dogs. They performed pretty poorly at actually identifying what mixes were in mixed breed dogs. So um, even the experts can't really tell the difference and we really can't say much about a mixed breed dog's parentage uh, without uh, having their actual uh, genetic results. And even those, as you learned yesterday, aren't necessarily 100%. The problem is, is that we humans make a lot of judgments about dogs based on their actual physical appearance. And there have been some studies that have investigated this. For example, in this study, which was a survey of college students, they showed them a random order of different pictures of dogs and asked them to rate personality traits based on the pictures of the dogs. And what was interesting, as you can probably appreciate at home, is that these two dogs are actually 
actually the same dog. Uh, they have just used the magic of probably Photoshop to change the coat color. And then these two dogs are actually the same dog. They have just changed the appearance of the dog's ears to make it look different. So these students were given these pictures of dogs in random order, and I believe if I recall this study correctly, that they also had some other pictures mixed in. And what they found is that the dogs with the yellow coat color were rated as more agreeable in personality and more emotionally stable than the dog with the black coat color despite the fact that this is the same exact dog. So they're using that coat color difference to, um, to make those personality assessments. They also um, rated these two dogs, or these two pictures at the bottom of this slide, and the dog with the pricked up ears was rated as being more extroverted, but the dog with the floppy ears was rated as being more emotionally stable and agreeable in personality. So I find that this is a really interesting study just looking at how we make snap, snap judgments about dog personality based on just their appearance below, alone. Following up with that, or kind of along the same lines, we also know that humans tend to make decisions or they might select pets based on an animal's appearance. So this was a study um, done in 2012, where they assessed dog adopters' uh, reasons for selecting a specific dog. And when they looked at the single most important driver, the single most important reason a dog was chosen, appearance of the dog was the most um, significant driver there. So that uh, if you look at the, the scale on the left, appearance was about 27% 20, uh, of the people rated appearance as being their primary uh, decision point. Only about 11% rated the animal's behavior with other people as the reason they chose that particular dog. And then just about 16% rated the dog's personality as the reason that they chose that dog. And if you're doing your math at home, you're gonna realize that those numbers do not make up 100%. <laughs> and that's because they also looked at a lot of other reasons why dogs might pick, or why people might pick particular dogs, but these were the three most common reasons that they, um, that they used. So we know humans make really important decisions based on an animal's appearance. We also have particular biases about animals based on their appearance. And these biases are some of the ones that I hear commonly in my practice. And we'll start with this one. All hounds are stubborn. You can't train hounds. They're just not motivated. Why even bother? And so that's a problem. If you come to um, your ownership of a beagle or a basset hound or a Rhodesian Ridgeback with the approach that this dog is stubborn, training isn't gonna be worthwhile, well, you might actually um, kind of create a self-fulfilling prophecy here. And there, this bias might be driven by the fact that hounds, um, when they were selected for uh, hunting and working, they were selected for independent work. So these dogs were dogs that were supposed to go out and hunt separated from their handler, unlike retrievers who are hunting based on uh, responses from their handlers. So maybe that independence, um, if we'll use a label there, um, is some of what drives that assumption that dogs or hounds are stubborn, um, but that is certainly not the case. We can't put all hounds in that box. And I'm going to start, um, give you an example of this. So this is my dear friend, Laura Monaco Torelli, who is a professional dog trainer. She is one of the most amazing trainers that I know. And um, one of her uh, areas of passion is training animals to cooperate in their veterinary care so that they can have um, access to health without being stressed and so that they're their people are also not stressed about veterinary visits, which we know is a huge issue. And so this is Laura with her dog, Santino, who is a Rhodesian Ridgeback. 
Before I start the video, I want to point out that Rhodesian Ridgebacks typically have a low tail carriage. So some people might look at that video and say, oh my gosh, that dog looks like he's worried because his tail is low. But this is actually the normal confirmation for a Rhodesian Ridgeback when they're feeling relaxed. And so what you're going to see in this video is Santino getting a vaccination. So he was due for his annual vaccinations. Laura had did, done some prep work. And you're going to see she shows us how she has taught Santino to do what we call a chin rest behavior. So he's going to, um, she's going to put a, a, a towel on her lap and he's going to rest his chin on that towel in order to earn food rewards. So without saying any more, I'll let you go ahead and watch. Laura always starts these training sessions with something fun, um, such as a spin or another uh, fun behavior that she has taught Santino. And here is his chin rest. So he gets reinforced with a treat for sticking his chin on that towel on her lap. And then Alex, who's our veterinary technician, she's actually giving him what we call pretend pokes. So she's got a capped syringe with a needle and she's not actually giving him vaccinations for those first two, but this is going live. So she's taking the cap off the needle. She's given him an injection under his skin. And you can see that Santino didn't even flinch. He's been prepared for this interaction. He is cooperating in his veterinary care. And then he gets to do a fun trick at the end. So this is a really fantastic way of showing how we can use training to enrich our dog's lives as well as um, to help them participate in their uh, veterinary care. And this is certainly not a stubborn hound. Laura's been able to use what she knows about uh, learning and modification of behavior to help her dog really thrive and build some resilience here. Okay, another false assumption that I hear all the time um, based on an animal's behavior or appearance is that all retrievers are friendly. And I have to say, I usually get some shocked looks when I have some clients coming in and they, they might come in with some assumptions about the types of dogs that I usually see in my practice. And when I tell them that in fact, I see dogs from all breeds, including Labrador retrievers and Golden Retrievers and Cavalier King Charles Spaniels that are coming to see me, um, most often for fear-related aggression, they just can't believe it. And it's important to just acknowledge that Labrador Retrievers are dogs. They're dogs just like all of the other dogs and they have emotions and they might perceive certain situations to be threatening and they're gonna use dog, their own behavior and their way of communicating to express when they're feeling threatened or when they're feeling uncomfortable. So this Labrador Retriever, I'm not really sure what's going on in the picture, but I can tell you that he's feeling really uncomfortable based on his body language. His brow is furrowed, um, his eyes are wide, we're seeing the whites of his eyes, we have, you know, the, the lips are drawn back from the teeth, and he's also leaning away. So we can tell that this dog is feeling threatened. Doesn't matter that he's a Labrador Retriever, he can feel these emotions. Another false assumption that we see all the time is the uh, idea that all pit bulls or pit bull type dogs are dangerous animals. And you might look at this picture and say, well, geez, that really looks like a dangerous animal. Look how he's biting the fence and growling and this looks really, really scary. And this dog, just like the Labrador Retriever in the other photo, is also responding to what he or she perceives to be a threatening situation. Now, the signal is more intense, so we're getting open mouth. We're probably having some barking and growling as well, and we might see a dog such as this jumping at the fence, but that higher intense signal is because that dog is perceiving a higher intense threat. So he's reacting based on what's going on in the moment. And um, this dog might have learned that lower level signals, such as just burying the teeth quietly, were ineffective at making the threat away. So has learned to escalate that signal. But pit bulls, just like Labrador Retrievers, just like all of the other dogs and mixed breed dogs, are capable of a wide range of emotions. And just like Labrador Retrievers, they can make amazing companion animals. We really can't put them in this box and just make a judgment based on their appearance that they're not safe to have in the home. They are just another dog like everybody else. So, Knowing a breed might help give us information about certain behavioral tendencies, as Dr. McClosey said on Friday. 
So we might know, and as actually our speakers had, had highlighted yesterday as well, so these huskies might be more capable of pulling a sled through the snow uh, because they have really great endurance and because they don't form ice balls in their feet and they've been selected for these particular traits so they might be really good at pulling the sled and we might be able to say yeah if you put a pug on that sled you're probably not going to get the same level of performance but this is what the trait that these dogs have been selected for so that's where we're going to see the behavioral difference this is only a small portion of the dog's whole behavioral repertoire though. And so dogs, again, are more similar to each other than they are different. And there are a lot of negative outcomes of using breed and appearance to make decisions about dogs. One of the most harmful things uh, that we see when we use breed and appearance to make decisions about dogs is what's called breed-specific legislation, or BSL. And in other areas of the world, it's, it might be called dangerous dog legislation. And for those of you who might not be familiar with it, breed-specific legislation are laws that are put into place to try to reduce the incidence of dog bite injuries and fatalities. And so, um, people made decisions about certain breeds of dogs being dangerous and then limit ownership of those dogs based on their physical appearance. And what we found is that when we actually look at the science here, breed-specific legislation does not improve safety and it does not decrease dog bite incidents. So this uh, study that was done in 2009 was a study that was done um, Oh my gosh, I'm going to forget. I believe it was in the Netherlands. And so they evaluated, um, they had a, a dangerous dog legislation in place, and then they evaluated dog bite uh, incidences since that legislation was put into place. And they also looked at what dog breeds were most uh, frequently involved in bite incidences. And what they found was that eight out of the 10 most popular breeds were also the most uh, frequent biters. And they basically summarize that all dogs can bite. And this is something that you know we in the behavior world are very aware of. Um, it doesn't matter what their breed is, any dog can potentially bite because it's part of their uh, normal defense mechanism and a response to stress and a threat. What they concluded is that it didn't make sense to have breed-specific legislation because based on the fact that eight out of the 10 most popular breeds were also the most frequent fighters, they'd have to remove so many dogs from the actual population. So it wasn't um, reasonable. So they actually then um, took away the breed-specific legislation in that country. Now the Clark and Fraser uh, study that was done in 2013 was actually done in Canada. So in this study, they looked at several different urban areas where the breed specific legislation had been enacted and compared it to dog bite injury rates uh, with urban areas in Canada where it had not been enacted and they didn't find a difference. So they didn't show that uh, breed specific legislation was actually protective or it reduced the incidence of dog bites. Um, it's really important to acknowledge these issues because things like breed-specific legislation uh, doesn't necessarily protect humans from harm, and it can create a lot of problems for the humans and the dogs involved. So we might actually find that um, owners of dogs that are um, considered dangerous might avoid things like veterinary care, so it could increase the risk of illness in those dogs, which, as I mentioned in my last talk, might actually um, potentially increase the risk of behavioral problems. And we also might see that people aren't taking their dog out into public or they aren't socializing them appropriately um, when they, they need that socialization. And that also might perhaps increase the risk of problematic behaviors. So it really um, is legislation that doesn't make sense. Uh, leading into that, uh, false assumptions can also lead to poor welfare for the dogs and compromise safety for humans. So just to reiterate, we might find that these dogs aren't getting appropriate medical care, they're losing their homes, and um, we might also find that 
as um, there are some other studies to point out that dogs that are labeled as pit bulls or pit bull breeds also end up staying in shelters for longer periods of time and they're unlike or they're less likely to be adopted. And that's a significant issue for these dogs. And it's such an issue that a lot of uh, shelter groups and rescue groups and even veterinarians have come to the realization that labeling dogs by specific breeds when we don't know their parentage doesn't make any sort of sense. And it leads us to, make, uh, to form biases about these dogs. So rather than saying that this dog is a pit bull mix, I have no idea if this dog is a pit bull mix. We should just really call it a mixed breed dog. Or some shelters even come up with really creative names um, for what they call their mixes that are just totally made up and unrelated to any of the dog breeds that we have. False assumptions can also lead uh, to poor welfare for dogs and compromise safety for humans when we think about the other end of the spectrum. And that means those dogs that we naturally perceive as friendly or great family dogs. And so I was reading a, a chapter in a book at one point and I kind of had a light bulb moment. And I actually think it might've been a chapter that uh, Julie Hecht had co-authored where they were talking about dog behavior and reading body language and how as behaviorists, you know, we're gonna look at body language of a dog and we're gonna maybe make some assumptions about behavior based on the body language, but that's not the way that the general public sees dogs. General public makes decisions about dogs behavior based on their appearance. So a lot of people might see a picture such as this and say, oh my gosh, that's so cute. Look at that beautiful golden retriever and that cute little boy. They just look so great together. And I know that this is true because pictures such as this are all over social media. Um, I constantly see pictures online of dog and child interactions where I'm actually saying, oh, that dog looks really uncomfortable um, and it doesn't seem like anybody is picking up on those signals. So what I see in this specific picture, yes, it's a lovely golden retriever. Yes, it's a very cute little boy, but this golden retriever is stressed. So I'm making that assessment based on the ear position of this dog. Um, her ears are pulled back. She also has what I would consider a furrowed brow. So I don't know if you can see this at home, but I can see that there's a wrinkle um, between her eyes. Uh, she's panting. Now, I don't know what the ambient temperature is in the environment in this picture. So that might be because uh, she's feeling overheated or just trying to regulate her body temperature. But it's also possible that given her ears are pulled back and her brow is furrowed, that she's panting because she's stressed. And then a big signal here is that she's leaning away from this hug. So she's using all of this body language to signal she's uncomfortable and she really wants this interaction with this child to stop. And so the problem here is, is if we just look at this dog's appearance and say, oh, look at this lovely golden retriever. How cute is this? And how cute is this kid with this dog? We're missing all of these subtle uh, body language signals. And that means that we're not going to change things for this dog in the future. This dog is going to continue to potentially have interactions with this child that make it feel uncomfortable. And at best, that means that dog is going to experience some chronic stress and anxiety. And what it also might learn is that these signals are ineffective at ending what it considers to be an uncomfortable interaction. And she might start eventually escalating her behavior. So instead of leaning away, panting and pulling her ears back, she might actually start showing her teeth, growling, snapping, and even biting in order to end an interaction that she finds uncomfortable. So remember that these false assumptions are a problem, not only for dogs that are labeled as dangerous, but also for dogs that we just label as, oh, they're super tolerant and friendly and um, love all humans. That's not necessarily the case, and we gotta look at individual situations uh, when we make uh, judgments about behavior. This is also a problem when it comes to small breed dogs. And I pulled this specific picture. I use this picture of this Pomeranian all the time when I'm talking about body language with veterinary students and other veterinarians or, or the general public. And I pulled this one specifically because whenever I pull up this slide in those audiences, it gets a big laugh. 
And that's a common response that I see to small breed dogs that are using aggression. We find that these behaviors in small breed dogs are not as problematic and they're potentially not as problematic to us. We might find that a dog um, that is growling, snapping, or biting when it's only 12 pounds presents less of a risk to us as human beings in terms of our safety. But the dog is terrified. So this dog is you know, snarling. Um, you can see how big uh, this dog's eyes are. It also has a furrowed brow. I can see a wrinkle in between those eyes. This dog is perceiving a life-threatening situation and is using its behavior to try to get out of that situation. So even if we think that this is funny or it's no big deal because it's not a risk to us, this dog's welfare is compromised. And so when things are not as big of a safety issue for us, we might force dogs into situations despite them showing us these very clear signals that they're uncomfortable and continue, continue interactions that are unpleasant for the dog. And we might actually teach these dogs that they need to escalate to the level of bite in order to um, get us to stop what we're doing. And um, the safety issue, you know, a lot of people will say, well, okay, it's not as dangerous when we have a, dog, a small breed dog biting as when we have a large breed dog biting. But in fact, I mean, I've certainly met some clients where they had a eight pound dog and um, delivered a bite that was hard enough to cause nerve damage in that individual, in the human's finger. So they still are powerful animals and can cause some, some physical harm. So it is still a safety concern for the humans involved. But my, my biggest concern with these guys is um, their actual welfare. So um, the small breed dogs kind of uh, unfortunately uh, get put into a lot of situations that we would probably avoid if it was a dog of a larger size. Another problem with making judgments about dog breed is that sometimes our biases can actually become self-fulfilling prophecies. And I also see this in my day-to-day -day practice. So we um, will sometimes see dogs, uh, or dogs and their owners, and the owner assume because they had a breed such as a German Shepherd, which some people um, might label as more dangerous than others. And so they took them to a trainer that um, specialized in German Shepherds or used particular training techniques, often harsh training techniques, in order to control their dog better or avoid uh, aggressive behavior so that they could be a safe companion living in their home. And in fact, what sometimes happens is that those uh, measures actually become self-fulfilling prophecies. Because as I mentioned in my last talk, when we use harsh training methods in order to address behavioral problems, we actually increase the risk that that animal is going to develop fear and potentially learn to use aggression in order to um, cope with its environment and cope with interactions with other people. So, um, we can't use appearance really to give us any information about a dog's parentage nor about its behavior or personality traits despite our constant kind of inclination to do so. And I would also say we can't use behavior in the moment to give us a ton of information about a dog's personality. So I unfortunately see this all the time in the veterinary clinic setting where we might have a dog that comes in and it's really stressed and it's really scared and it's showing behavior such as this chihuahua with ears pulled back, furrowed brow, but also growling, snapping, and potentially biting. And then that dog gets labeled as a bad dog or a mean dog because it's responding this way in this specific context. But really all we can take from this behavior is this is the, this dog's response to this particular situation or context. And that might be related to things that happened that day, that might be related to the fact that it's feeling ill or uncomfortable, um, or it might be related to its past learning experience in that environment. But it's important to recognize that we really can't use these signals to make blanket judgments about this particular dog's personality. There's a really interesting uh, term that's used in human psychology called the fundamental attribution error, which is when we humans make judgments about other individuals given 
their behavior in the moment. And I guess the best example of this I would give is if you're driving along in traffic and you're trying to get to work and somebody cuts you off with their car and you're like, ah, oh, that person's such a jerk. Oh my gosh, they're so mean. Oh, what's wrong with them? We make a snap judgment about that, pers that person's personality and their character given that one interaction. But we don't know what might be going on with that person. Maybe they're rushing to the hospital because their child is sick. Or maybe they overslept for a job interview and just really need to get somewhere fast. So we can't make judgments about human personality based on momentary interactions with that. And we really can't make judgments about dog's personality given a one minute interaction or just given a picture of their behavior. So the signals or the body language that a dog is um, giving in a situation are not a static reflection of that animal's underlying personality. It's really interesting because I get questions all the time um, when I speak at conferences or even uh, when I'm talking to veterinary students or um, pet owners that find out what I do um, a, when we're not meeting in a consultation situation. And people might say, oh, my dog does this, what do I do? Or, oh, I really want to address this behavior, but I don't know how to fix it. W what should I do? And, and are expecting a simple one minute answer. But I would tell you that as part of my day-to-day -day job as a behaviorist, in order for me to effectively help a client figure out how to change their pet's behavior, we first have them fill out a very lengthy history questionnaire. I have sometimes had clients say, thank you for allowing me to do my dissertation on my dog's behavior, because that is how long it is. Um, so we're gathering a ton of information, not only on the problem behaviors themselves, what that looks like in the environment, but also just kind of the, the information about the dog's environment, other behaviors that they might be seeing. So we're gathering all that information before the appointment, and then we actually sit down and talk about it for yet more time. So usually I do initial assessments in an hour, which is actually a pretty short period of time for veterinary behaviorists. And I'm just trying to gather more information, figure out what my client's expectations and goals are, and then start working together in order to treat that dog's behavioral problem. So I also cannot make a judgment about dog's personality given a limited amount of information, nor can I really effectively help people to change their animal's behavior given a small amount of information. I really gotta understand the context, the animal's history and how they've responded in that context in the past, and what the outcomes of the behavior are, what that behavior actually gets the animal or gets the animal away from in order to really inform how we're gonna move about and treat them. So just wrapping up here, the way that I would conclude this is it's really important to pay attention to behavior rather than appearance. Remember that that physical variation uh, that makes dogs look different from one another is less than 1% of their genome. And dogs are actually a lot more similar to each other than they are different. When we're looking at behavior, we have to look at behavior in the moment, but also look at how that animal's behaved in that situation or similar situations in the past to really figure out what that behavior means. And while we are not born knowing dog body language or all the subtleties about dog body language at least, that is a skill that we can develop and learn. We can start to understand ear position and uh, Things like lip licking and yawning that might signal that the animal is stressed or feeling uncomfortable and then use that information to help our dogs navigate through life in a more effective way. We also need to be careful about avoiding making assumptions about safety based on breed. And this is important not only for dogs that might be labeled as dangerous or breeds that might be labeled as dangerous, but also for dogs that might be labeled as always friendly or always really tolerant. Um, this is another one of those pictures that kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies whenever I see it. Yes, this is a beautiful golden retriever and this family looks, the, the humans in this family look really happy, but this dog certainly looks uncomfortable and and having a toddler bounce on its back is not something that that dog should need to endure. This is not an appropriate uh, dog-child interaction, and it's not taking into account this dog's needs or its emotions in this context. 
And then it's also important to start thinking about using what we know about behavioral genetics to make informed breeding decisions. And so obviously the science is um, still very early on this, but there's been some exciting talks uh, given by Dr. Wade and Dr. Carlson yesterday talking about the heritability of desirable traits as well as the heritability of undesirable traits. And we know um, from some of those studies in the nervous pointers and studies that have been done with working dogs that things like fear and anxiety are heritable conditions. And if we, um, one of the things that I would love is that if we see that dogs are fearful, we avoid breeding them to one another because we know that those traits are gonna get passed along. And that's one of the main stressors on the human animal bond that I see in my day-to-day -day practice. It's also important not to make um, decisions about if you're going to take a buy a breeder or I'm sorry buy a puppy from a breeder, look at the behavior of the immediate relatives of that dog to help you make a decision on whether or not that's going to be an appropriate pet for you, rather than just saying, "Oh my gosh, all boxers are friendly. I can just go ahead and get any boxer." They're all individuals, and uh, you need to make careful choices in order to have uh, the best possible relationship and give your dog the best possible and most appropriate home for it. So with that, I'm wrapping up. Um, I wanted to end on this slide because while this is a canine conference, we's, we've also had a number of cats joining in. Um, and I love seeing all of those pictures over Twitter. This is actually uh, my cat, Angus, who passed away last year. Um, he was a really lovely cat, and we often called him a dog cat because he was so friendly and sociable. But I kind of feel like that doesn't give cats enough credit. A lot of cats can be friendly and sociable. Um, um, and that's just them being cats. That's not them being dogs. And then the dog in the picture is my brother-in-law's dog, Wiley, who has also passed away. These two were great pals, and they love to cuddle together all the time. And they taught me a lot about behavior, too. So, all right. Thank you so much for um, watching. I look forward to your questions and uh, all the pictures of the amazing animals you're sharing your homes with.